Graceful receiving is one of the most wonderful gifts we can give anybody. If we receive what somebody gives us in a graceful way, we've given that person, I think, a wonderful gift. This is my friend Jeff Erlinger. He's one of my neighbors here, and I asked him if he would come by today. I'd like to sing that to you and with you. Okay, okay? sure. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. The way you are right now. The way down deep inside you, not the things that hide you, not your fancy chair, <laughs> that's just beside you. It's an honor to be here tonight, to be part of your proud moment, this proud moment. You know, when, when you tell people that it's you I, it's you I like, you, we know that you really mean it. And tonight, I want to let you know that on behalf of millions of children and grown-ups, it is you that I like. Mm, that feels good. Oh, there's Officer Clemens. Hi, Officer Clemens. Come Hello, in. Rogers, how are you? Fine. Why don't you sit down? Oh, sure. Just for a moment. Oh, it's so warm. I was just uh, putting some water on my feet. Oh, it sure is. Would you like to join me? It looks awfully enjoyable, but I don't have a towel or anything. Oh, you share mine. Okay. Sure. But how do we make goodness attractive? By doing whatever we can to bring courage to those whose lives move near our own. By treating our neighbor at least as well as we treat ourselves. And allowing that to inform everything that we produce. Who in your life has been such a servant to you? Who has helped you love the good that grows within you? Let's just take 10 seconds to think of some of those people who have loved us and wanted what was best for us in life. Those who have encouraged us to become who we are tonight. Just 10 seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. no matter where they are, either here or in heaven. Imagine how pleased those people must be to know that you thought of them right now. Mr. Rogers, all. Oh. How many of you guys, there, there's a whole generation that's probably sitting in the back right now, and they're like, who is that man? Uh, and then there's a generation of us that are sitting down going, no, no, that's the man, right? And um, we are in this series called Influence. And the reason why I played Mr. Rogers is because I can't think of a bigger influence um, that somebody had on an entire generation. And uh, Mr. Rogers, um, I, I, and I'm not going to talk about him the whole time, but um, just in, 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 I'm a little on the, I'm on the end of Mr. Rogers. Um, but I'll tell you this, I've read a lot about Mr. Rogers. And he changed a course of, of, of culture by doing the weirdest things today. And you know what it was weird? He was nice. That's all it was. He treated a neighbor like a neighbor. He loved all those around him. Didn't matter um, uh, what they were like. He loved them. And he was the biggest influence 
to an entire generation. And so today, as we're, in, like, as we're walking through this series of influence, I thought, what better way to start it than with Mr. Rogers? Yeah, did somebody get into nostalgic? Somebody started getting tears up in there, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I got, I got a lot of ones that will make us cry. All right, so um, as we get started here, I want to uh, do a little bit of a recap of last week as we introduced this series, and then I'm just going to kind of share uh, my heart um, on where we're headed today. Sound good? Yes. I'm going to need your help today, though, because I need, I'm going to need you guys to talk back to me. Yes? yes. All right, perfect. All right, last week we, we defined influence as this. It is the capacity to have an effect on the character development or behavior of someone or something. It's this idea of having an effect on somebody, right? Um, we change basically this idea, their character, who they are. If they're acting out in a certain sort of way, some way that we know that they're not to be. If you're around them, do you have influence on them to change basically or affect them in a way where they would want to change? Hence thinking of Mr. Rogers. Perfect influence. Another way is this their development or their behavior, right? Those development and the behavior is the same exact way. Your effect on somebody. Does their behavior change when you enter into the room? Why? It's because you have influence there. Does this make sense? Um, but in, in the midst of talking about influence, we have to talk about the negative as well. And, and here's this. You have influence, intimidation, and manipulation. If influence is the effect that we have on somebody, there's a lot of people that like to be influential, but they're not influential. They are basically intimidating, right? And if they're intimidating, that means they're using fear to try to change your behavior, your character, um, or trying to develop you, right? So they're, they're using that intimidation model to do that. The next one is manipulation, which means this. They are controlling how you do things. They're controlling your character. They are controlling all these different things. The best way that I can like give you a description of this is looking at parenting. If you look at parenting, you'll start to see this. Which one do you want to be in? Do you try to parent your child through intimidation or manipulation, or do you just have an effect on your child because of who you are? And let's just be real. This is not an all-the-time thing. Sometimes we go in and out of these, right? But we need to be able to catch ourselves because I do not believe God wants us to, uh, to move with anybody, whether it's children or adults, co-workers, um, or the student body, or wherever you're at. I don't think God ever wants you to intimidate somebody. I don't think he ever wants you to move in fear because fear is of the enemy, right? And the last one is this, is control. You never want to control somebody because in the scripture, that's actually called witchcraft. When you don't give somebody the free will choice, when you are controlling them, it literally is called witchcraft in the scriptures. Is everybody still hanging with me? Yeah? So um, the idea then, is we want to remember this, is this. Influence allows the person being influenced to have free will to make a choice in any given situation. We want to make sure that we still preserve, right, we preserve the greatest gift, or one of the greatest gifts that God's given us, which is free will. The greatest gift obviously being salvation, right? But it's our free will. He doesn't force you to, to, to love him. He doesn't control you to love him. He gives you the choice to love him or not. And if we're honest, looking at the body of Christ, which is the church, we should have an influence on culture. We should have an influence in our society. And if we don't, we have to ask the question, why? Everybody still walking with me in this one? So that's where we've been at. So I have uh, been all week long studying, um, going through different things. I sat down last night to complete um, the entire like you know uh, sermon this morning or for this morning, and I got to it. And I'll be honest with you guys, I I didn't like it. It was boring. It was stupid. Matter of fact, I got to the place last night because I was so frustrated and trying to make it actually fit to what I wanted to share and what I wanted to, sh to say that I actually just went, you know what? I'm done. And I threw it all away. I was like, delete, gone. So about midnight or early this morning, um, I was like, you know what, God, what do you want to share? Just help me walk through what you want this morning. And this is where I'm at. So if this sermon seems a little um, um, discombobulated, um, that's a big word, yeah, right? Um, out of sorts, um, I apologize. But I really just want to share my heart with you today. And my heart is this. Um, in order to influence somebody, you have to know how you're viewing somebody. I, I want to just 
kind of get that in our frame of mind. As we're talking today, I'm going to be talking about influence. Now, influence is obviously you know, affecting somebody else. But the problem is, is I can't really affect somebody else if I think something different about that person. Did that make, yes? Yeah. And so I was sitting there and I was like, this is where I want to go, God. How do I explain it to people? And then Numbers 22 came to mind. And so I want to read to you Numbers 22. Now, over the years of our church, I've, I've shared Numbers 22 to you. It is one of the best scriptures ever recorded in the King James Version of the Bible. Okay? And you will understand that when we start reading it. Okay? I am not going to give you a ton of backlog historical context of why this is going on. I just want to get to the main points of it. And, and, and the only way I could do that is just kind of just reading it. Okay? So I, the, the backlog and the, the, slow, the, the fastest way I can give it is this. Israel has a lot of people. But they're still wandering in the desert. But they have literally almost a million people. And when you see a million people marching around your city, you get freaked out. And so there was a man um, named Balak um, who basically said, he was a king, and he says, I'm scared of these people. He called up uh, basically a witch doctor. That's the best way I can describe him to you. His name is Balaam. And he says, you curse, uh, you curse people. And when you curse people, they are cursed. And when you basically show favor on people, they have favor. So I'm going to pay you to go curse the Israelites. Go curse the Hebrew people. So that way God will be against them and they'll stay away from my, uh, from my land. That's the backstory. God says this. Now, now, Balaam knows God. Okay, Literally, he knows God. And he still does the opposite anyways. Do you see the free will? God doesn't intimidate him. God doesn't um, uh, control him in that way. He lets him have free will. Yes? So watch this. So Balaam asks God, can I go? And God says, no. And then Balaam goes again, can I go? And he says, no. And then he asks him a third time, hey, can I go? And, and God says, sure, go ahead and go. And then when he went, God got mad at him. And the best way I can explain it to you, best way, if you are a teenager, you know this. When you ask your parents if you can go somewhere, what do they say? No. But do you leave it at a no? No. You come back 10 minutes later. Why can't I go? Can I go? No. Then the third time you come back, and the reason why you come back a third time is because you know if you keep poking us, eventually they will say what? Yes, just fine. Leave me alone. Go. Go, right? And you know it, right? But here's the problem. Then you go, and then your parents get mad at you that you win. You're like, but you said I could go. This is the exact same situation. This is the exact same situation. Why is Balaam? God said don't go. You're not going to go curse my people. You're not going to go do that. But I want, I, there's money involved, God. Lots of money. I don't care. No, no, no. You're going to go anyways, aren't you? Maybe. So he says, fine, go. But when you go, you only do what I tell you. Balaam gets up and he leaves. But in his heart, he knew, I'm not going to do what God's telling me to do. Are you guys with me? So God's anger is burning against Balaam. Because he's finally like, look, I'll meet you halfway. Because our God is so loving. He meets us where we're at, right? He says, fine, I'll meet you. But you can only do what I say. And, he, and, and Balaam's like, I'm going to curse your people. That's what I'm getting paid to do. Are you, you, yes, we're all here? This is where we pick up the story. This is where the account picks up. Okay? This is Numbers 22, chapter uh, verse 21 uh, through the end. I think it's like 30-something. Anyways, so it says this. Balaam got up in the morning saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite, uh, the Moabite officials. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road and into a field. Now I want you to get this. Angel of the Lord. We're not talking short person. With, like, like you, I mean, think about this. Bless you. Think about this. Angel of the Lord, huge, mighty. I'm thinking seven foot tall, okay? 
I'm thinking maybe muscular, looking like Superman, right? With a big sword in his hand. And it's just sitting there waiting for the donkey to show up. The donkey's like, uh-uh, not happening. Go to the field, right? Are you guys with me on this one? I just want you to visually see it in your mind of what's happening, okay? Standing uh, with a drawn sword in his hand, and it turned uh, off to the field. Balaam beat it to get it back onto the road. Now, we have to understand the word beat it. Physically took his staff and hit it as hard as he could probably to get it back to where it goes. When it says beat it, it doesn't mean try to, you know, a little tappy tappy on the, on the back of the donkey, like move this way. No, no, no. He's, way, he's hitting, beating this donkey. Does that make sense? To get it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path uh, through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. Think about this. It's a narrow path. Saw the angel of the Lord, and it was like, no, 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 no. Right? A donkey, you straddle it. His leg is now getting crushed against the wall. And what happens, right? Um, so, he, so he beats the donkey again. Stupid donkey, I hate you. And he starts beating the donkey again. Right? And then it goes on. It says, then... The angel of the Lord moved ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it laid down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. So you think about this. The donkey's like, I got nowhere to go. And it just stopped and dropped. And by this time, Balaam has had it. And he gets off the donkey and he starts hitting it. Now, this is absolute abuse to this donkey, right? Some of you are sitting here like this and being like, dude, that is messed up. Somebody should hit that guy with a staff, right? But if you guys remember, why is the donkey doing this? Because God wants to hit him with a sword. And you're walking with me on this one, right? I'm showing you that this man is not the best of men. Okay, and he goes on, he says, um, uh, to beat it with the staff. Then verse 28, it says this. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make, uh, to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey. And before I move forward. <laughs> anybody else catch that? Yeah. When your donkey starts to talk to you, something's wrong. Are, are you with me on that? That's like your dog staring at you and being like, what's up? And you're like, ah! Like, right? You don't, you don't sit there and start having a conversation with the dog. You freak out and you run away, right? Balaam doesn't even skip a beat. Does that make sense? He's like, hey, what made you beat me these three times? And Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If I only had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. And I want you to understand this. Balaam is not thinking about anybody else but himself. And when you think about any, when you, when you stop thinking about somebody else and you only start thinking of you and it becomes selfish, what happens? You start to hurt the people that are trying to help you. I want you to catch this. You start hurting the people that are trying to help you. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? And the donkey pleads with Balaam. And he tries to get Balaam to understand this one concept. Balaam, I have been your donkey for years. You have ridden me to and from. We've gone hundreds of miles together. Have I, have, have I ever done this? Ever? Are you, are you walking in this? Have I ever done this? And then it goes on. No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed down low and fell, uh, fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked, um, asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? 
I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey uh, saw me and turned away from these, uh, turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would have certainly have killed you by now. But I would have, but I would have spared it. Oh, at this moment, what do you think Balaam's thinking? Honestly. What guilt is on Balaam in this moment right now? Think about this. The donkey was just trying to protect you. And it did. Because if the donkey didn't care about you, he would have ran right up to me. And bye bye Balaam. Goes on. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. Now, before we move forward, um, go back to that one. Sorry, it was my fault. It says this, I did not realize. I want you to hang on that, word, that, that, that phrase. I did not realize. I did not realize. It says, I will go back. And then he finishes off by saying this. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went uh, to Balak's officials, and he goes, and he did what only God told him to do. Does that make sense? Why? Because now he's a little bit afraid of God, right? He put down his big stick, right, the big sword. Now here's where I want to be. Like I said, there's a whole backlog to this, and like I said, it's the funniest story if you read it in the King James Version, because King James Version uses the real, the real name for a donkey. Um, and when that starts talking to you, there's problems, right? So, listen. <laughs> listen. My main thing that I want just to focus on today is this. Balaam's reaction to the donkey. Balaam had assumed a few things, did he not? That his donkey was just being ornery. His donkey was not doing what the donkey uh, wanted him to do. And so he, he starts beating the donkey. And I'm wondering how many times in our life have we, and I'll use the word metaphorically speaking, beat somebody, rejected somebody, hurt somebody, because we did not realize what they were truly trying to do. If you are ever to have influence in anybody's life, you need to stop seeing people through your own eyes, through how each person can benefit you. Are you walking with me in this one? I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just asking questions this morning because if we are really going to get to it, I, I'll use Mr. Rogers as that example. He didn't look at it. How can this person benefit me? How can this person get me further ahead in my career? How can this person get me more money? He never thought that. How do I know? Because he has letters. He never did. He was the most gentle, caring man on the planet at the time. And what did he do? He just wanted to care for others. Are you walking in this? See, things start to happen in our lives, and the first thing that we do is we always think they do it against us. That's our first thing. And so today, I wanted to walk through what, um, what influence truly looks like. Because we think there's one area of influence, and the reality is there's six. There's six different areas of influence, and I'm not going to be able to go through all six of them, but I want to give you guys uh, uh, an understanding of it the best way that I can. Because the hope is that when we leave here, or when you click off on us today, that you leave here with, our, with your pride nailed to the seats or wherever you're at, and that when you get up to go, you would go in God's blessing, in God's favor, in God's eyes, seeing what the donkey saw, seeing how God sees things. Yeah? yeah? So watch this. Here's the thought process. There are elements in life that affect whether you want to do something, that's motivation, and can do something. That's ability. Okay? So you have two ideas. We have motivation and we have ability. Everybody with me on this one? Motivation, right? This is the best part. Motivation. It's us doing something, right? We're motivated. Let's go and do it, right? Ability. Do I have the ability to go do it, though? 
Think of the donkey. The donkey had the motivation, but did not have the ability to convey what was going on. Did you guys get that? He had the motivation. I don't want to go next to the guy with the sword. I don't want my guy to die, my, my, my owner to die. I don't want to die. I'm going to stay away from the guy with the sword. I'm going to go into a field. I'm going to go crush your foot against a wall. I'm just going to lay down. He had the motivation, but he did not have the ability to share what was going on. Did you see that? So what happens is, is Balaam took the motivation, but didn't understand the ability or didn't understand what was going on and did what? Look like a jerk and hurt people. How many times have we done that? How many times have we had good intentions or good motives, but didn't realize that people didn't have the ability to do it? Can, yes? Oh, I'm gonna go a little deeper, is that okay? I'm gonna use homeless people as the example. Because I think this is something that you guys can all see and do, okay? In California, we have half of the homeless population in the entire nation lives here in California. Half. Okay? So I want you to understand this. Most people, when they see a homeless person, you don't want to give them money. You don't want to help them out. You might feel a little bad for them, but majority, I didn't say you, majority of the people go, they're just going to use it for drugs, so I'm not going to help them out. Does that make sense? So what do we do? We've already, put, we've already put assumptions onto people that we don't know anything about, and what do we do? We hurt people. How do you know? I went up to the Tenderloin. The Tenderloin is um, basically Skid Row for um, San Francisco. Okay, um, so if you go to LA and you go to Skid Row in LA, you see all the, the homeless shelters and all that kind of stuff. In uh, San Francisco, it's the same way. Um, it, it, it's not the nicest area. And me, being stupid as I am, I decided to bring like 40 kids with me. Hey, let's go run around the Tenderloin, all right? So um, that's literally what we did. And we got to talk with them and we asked the question, why are you on the street? We're not gonna assume anything. Why are you on the street? It turned out that 70% of the people up in San Francisco is on the street, not because uh, they lost their job, not because they are addicts. They literally are on the street. 70% of them, which there's a lot, they were on the street because a family member got sick and they couldn't pay the medical bills. And the government came and the hospitals came and took everything from them. I just want us to think about that. You lost somebody that you love and you care about, right? And then the collection people start calling. You could barely get on your feet because your wife died or your, or, your, or your husband died or a child died and you're trying to deal with that and now you're dealing with that and collection agencies. And what are you trying to do? You're trying to numb the pain. How do you numb that pain? Maybe alcohol, maybe the prescription drugs that that, that loved one still has in the house. Are, are you walking with me in this? Yeah. There is more to the backstory than you could probably ever imagine. But you know what we do? We assume. We look at them and we say, they're not motivated enough. And it's not just that they're not motivated. You guys gotta realize they don't have the ability. You can walk up to them and give them a great sermon. Pull up your bootstraps. Get out there and do it. You're awesome. Go do these things. You're amazing. And they're like, yeah. How? But you're already gone. You're already off to the next one. Come on. You got it. Nobody takes the time to sit back and say, you can use my house for a shower. Oh, no, pastor, you went too far. Don't, no, no. That's my stuff. Don't bring my stuff into this. We're going to separate. Why? Because we still want to keep them at a distance. Did, yes? There's a difference between motivation and the ability that they have. And so many times, we only look at the motivation part. There's another thought process. I'm like, I'm gonna, are we, can I keep going? Is this okay? I don't want to, yeah. So here's, here's what I want you to see. I know it's a little difficult. I know it's a little thing. So here, here, here it is. You have the top, the top line, this whole top section. That's your motivation. The bottom is all your ability. So we have top shelf, bottom shelf. Everybody with me? 
Top shelf, motivation. Bottom shelf, ability. Everybody good with this? Yes? Now watch this, okay? We all live top shelf. We all live top shelf. That is, that is where we live. Motivation, 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 motivation. Um, you have this in, in, in the three categories. So you have motivation, top, ability, bottom. Then you have three categories. Personal, okay? That means this, it's you. It's inside of you. It's who you are. So it's your personal motivation, your personal ability. Have we got it? Then you have your social, that's the middle column. Your social is all the people around you all the influence of the people around you, right? So you provide uh, encouragement, right, for people around you. They provide encouragement for you, right? And then the ability, the ability part would be provide assistance. Are you guys walking with me? So you have your social with the people around you. Then you have structural, okay? The structure, basically. It's the physical environment in which you live. You can't forget about that. The physical environment in which you live. There's so many times where, like, I'll say something at the church, and I'll just be real with you all, right? We're, like, we're in this place right now. We're, like, we have all these people. We're in this driveway. We're at all these different houses. How do we do this? And people look at us and say, just go get a building. You don't think the motivation is there to get a building? It's the ability that we don't have. Does that make sense? The motivation is there. So then I want us to think this. So we have, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I will be going through all of them in the series. Does that make sense? So right now I want to focus on the personal. That first column, motivation and ability, right? The donkey had the motivation, did not have the ability. Yes? yes. Moving forward. Uh, here's the next uh, thought process that I had is this. If we make decisions based upon the pleasure or pain of a behavior, all we are setting ourselves up for is despair. I want to stop right there before I read further. Most of us make decisions based upon, is this going to hurt me or make me happy? Does that make sense? Pleasure and pain. When you put behavior into those two categories, you will never ever be satisfied and you will constantly be living in despair. Because every behavior that you do will never satisfy you. And you'll constantly feel like, why am I despair all the time? Can I be honest? 2020 in a nutshell. Was that not true? 2020 in a nutshell. There was motivation, but we didn't have the ability. And what we did is we started making decisions based off of pain or pleasure, which is what makes me happy, what doesn't. And then what happened is we just felt ourselves always living in despair. And we're like, why? Because it's not how it is. Here it is. The reality is, and this is going to be hard, so let me walk you through it, okay? The reality is how we feel about a behavior is more about how we think about the behavior than the actual behavior. Craig, that was just a bunch of gibberish. I get it. Let me walk you through. Ready, ready? I'll do it again. How we feel about a behavior, how we feel about it, okay, is more about how we think about the behavior than the actual behavior. Craig, I don't get it. You're a moron. Thank you. Don't judge me. Um, I have the ability. Give me a second, okay? All right. Watch this. This is the thought process. The next, the next, what's the next one? That, yes. The reason people can feel good by doing bad things is because how they, uh, they are representing it to themselves. It's how they are thinking about it. So if you ever wonder, why do bad guys steal? Because they're bad. Is that, that, that's literally our answer, right? Well, they shouldn't be stealing. That's not right. Stealing is bad. Tell that to a 10-year-old who has to take care of their 5-year-old and 3-year-old brother and sister living in Africa that can't get a job because of their age, yet they have to steal a literally three slices of bread in order to survive the next day. Is stealing okay? Oh, now there's a conundrum. Wait, wait, wait. You can't bring in little kids. That's not fair. But the problem is, is that we have to understand that it's not just this, this, this normal thing. We have to know the backstory. We have to know what's going on. We have to understand it. You see Jesus Christ nailed up to a cross. You all look at it differently. A non-believer goes, he, des he deserves that. Why? Because he's a liar. He deserves to be able to, they would never nail somebody to a cross that didn't deserve it. 
You don't think the Romans thought that? You don't think that the, the, that the Hebrew people thought that? No, this is a real thing. What happens is, is we judge because we judge on how it reflect, reflects us. Does that make sense? That means the way that we think about a situation, the way that we think about a behavior, is how it is. That's what I'm trying to explain. Did that make sense? The way you think about a behavior. So let's just walk around. I'm trying to put it in a better way. I don't know if I can. It's a normal behavior nowadays. People walk around and they are, we'll use the word loose, and have multiple different partners. Be on my wavelength. There's kids in the room, right? <laughs> have multiple different partners and they don't care. But you're a Christian. And what do you do? You think differently. You represent that behavior as something different. So when you look at that person, you say they are bad. But they don't think they're bad because what are they doing wrong? Heck, the Bible says be fruitful. Multiply. <laughs> oh, is that not in the right context? My bad. Are you guys with me on this one? This is how somebody can do something bad but actually think that it's not bad, but that it's good. Why am I explaining this to you? Because if you are ever to have influence on people, you can't walk around thinking that everybody's bad all the time. That doesn't give you influence. That just makes you mean. It makes you a jerk to so many different people. And then you wonder why, I, I try to witness to people all the time. They never listen to me. You think? <laughs> try getting their backstory. Try figuring out where they're coming from and love them for who they are. Everybody walking with me in this one. The next uh, thing is this. Um, Halloween. I'm going to give you guys uh, an experiment that was done. A social experiment that was done so that you guys could start understanding this. Because if we're going to have influence on people, you're like, Craig, I don't have the time to get everybody's backstory. You're right. But what you can do is help people change. You can change the frame in which you look at something. Okay? Halloween. Every kid on the planet knows about Halloween, right? This is the day that I, my parents, for some reason, they say, get as much candy as you can. <laughs> it's only one, it's like once a year. It's like, go get as much candy as you can. Every other day is, no, nah, no, nah, no eating, no, no candy, no this, no that. And they get, no, 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 no. One day a year, what is it? Go get candy, right? Best day for social experiments. So this is what they did. They took a bowl of candy with a sign that says, please take one. And there was a bowl of candy, and next to the bowl of candy was sliced apples. And they just let kids come up and grab it. What do you think happened? That bowl of candy and the time span of 40 minutes was replaced four times. And the bowl of apples, not one was taken. Why? Because the frame of mind is what? get candy. It doesn't mean they don't like apples. It just means their frame of mind is what? Get this. Do you see the motivation? Do you see that they have, they, right? So this is what they did. They put up a poster right next to, um, they put up a poster right next to the, to the apples and the candy and they didn't say anything, it's just a poster and this is what the poster looked like. Over the apples, they had Superman. This guy is ripped. He's got a 28 pack, I think. I'm not even sure what's going on with that. It's not real, right? And then we have Spider-Man that can barely climb up his rope. And underneath Superman, we have apples. And underneath Spider-Man with the hamburger and his thing, there's candy. And now, obviously, there's not a lot of kids that can probably read, but it says, what would your superhero eat? But let's just be real. Most of the kids are not reading that, right? They come up, and what do they look at? They look at this, and they go, oh. They had to refill the bowl of apples multiple times. They didn't have to say a word. Every other house had candy. They had a bowl of candy. What happened? What happened? It was this. Um, go to the next one real quick. Fr the, frame, uh, the frame was how much candy did I get? The frame was changed to who do I want to be? So when they walked up and all it was was an image, they stopped thinking of the frame of how much, how much, and they got to the frame of who, who, who. Did that make sense? 
So we got to get to a place to maybe when we're trying to influence people, we're not sitting around trying to, to basically give them like or be part of their frame. We have to get them out of their frame of thinking to get to where they need to be. Think of the donkey. The donkey had one frame. I can't speak, so I'm going to save. I'm going to go right. I'm going to go left. I'm going to duck down. I'm going to do what I can. That is the only frame that the donkey had. And when the donkey got the ability then the frame was changed for Balaam. Because Balaam had one frame. My donkey's a jerk. My donkey doesn't know what to do. Out of all these years I had this donkey, he's broken. The donkey finally broke. Does that make sense? One frame of mind. Never once thinking there could be a different reason that the donkey is doing this. Why? Because he was stuck in his frame. How many people do you know that they are stuck in a frame of thinking and you are too busy trying to be in their frame of thinking instead of standing back and saying, how can I point you to a different frame? Did that make sense? So then, go back to the, the one prior. It says this, we all have a frame in which we see things. If we change the frame, you can change the feeling. Did that make sense? Walk with me. I look up, I see candy, I see fat Spider-Man, right? Fast Spider-Man candy, and you know what? What? And I see Superman flying, 28-pack, apples. I, I like apples. Apples are good. Not because I see Superman, but because I do like apples. And all of a sudden, their frame, because it was changed, it's not that candy was bad. It's just their frame changed, so the feeling was different. When they walked up the first time and the sign wasn't there, they walked up with the frame, candy, candy. They wouldn't even look at the apples. Not because they don't like apples. It's because they had one way of looking at it. You think maybe as a Christ follower, one of the things that Jesus did when he came to the earth, he didn't tell you how to live, but he showed you a different frame in which you could live. And your job is to choose that frame, free will. Yeah? yeah. Is this all making sense? Are you guys are you hanging? Yeah. Okay, I got one last thing for you. Got one last, uh, yeah, one last thing for you. So if we go back to that um, thought process, the, the frames, then go to the next one. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, next, there it is. So we go back to this. If we're thinking about personal, right? Motivation, we want to help them love what they hate. The only way you can help them love what they hate is if you change their frame, which means changing the feeling in which they see it. Did that make sense? Now here's the thing. This isn't, this, this isn't super easy all the time. It's gonna take a lot of time and effort from you to be there for them. Because why? Not only do you have this personal part of it, but you have to give them the ability to do so. What does that mean? Help them do what they can't. You have to teach them skills. You can't just sit there, and here's the thing, this is what churches do all the time, and, and we are, uh, we as a church, I, I bring us into that. What do we do? We get up here, we motivate, 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 motivate. You can do it, you can do it. Follow Christ, follow Christ, follow Christ. I still hate the way that Christians live. I never changed the way that you thought. I just was really loud and excited about it. But if you don't go home and change your ways, then what do we really do here? Except got really excited, wasted our time. And we all said, yeah! One of the things that I think the church, and this is where Jesus came in, he said discipleship. Discipleship was motivation with the ability to do it. Does that make sense? Help them, uh, help them do what they can't. You see, a, 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 and it will go back to the homeless story. You see a homeless person on the side of the street, right? You just throw money at them, and you feel good about you. Money does not give them ability to do anything. How about you sit with them, you talk with them, you have a lunch with them, maybe a breakfast with them or a dinner with them, you talk with them, find out where they have, and find out what they need help in. Maybe they need to get to a rehab center. Maybe they need to get to a hospital. Maybe they got to do that, but they don't have the skills to do it. Why? Because they're just still living in the same frame that they're living in. Throwing money at them does not help them. Are you walking with me in this one? And I'm not, listen, I want you to plug this into all these areas in your life including your children. All this works in that. So the last thing is this, help them do what they can't. Have you ever heard of the marshmallow test? Oh, marshmallow test. You get a bunch of little kids, okay? And you get one of those fat marshmallows, okay? And you put it on a plate in front of them. And you look at them and you tell them, 
don't eat it. If you don't eat it, I have a special treat for you afterwards. Don't eat it. And they leave the room for five minutes. 90% of the children that they tested failed miserably. And here's the thing, if I had time, I'd show you guys a bunch of different videos. I'm telling you right now, go watch the videos. They are hilarious. There's a kid that puts the whole thing in his mouth, puts it back out, sets it on the plate, looks at it, looks away, looks at it again, takes half a bite. One of them is just sniffing it the whole time, doing that, like, mmm, mmm, and then puts it down. But at the end of the day, they eat it. 90% eat it, right? 90% eat it. Well, here's what they decided to do. They actually took a 20-year test of this. This was for 20 years they did it. Those kids who graduated have their own kids. They found out that the 10%, the 10% had higher um, SAT scores, went to better colleges, and did that. But do you know what the difference was? It wasn't their character, wasn't their personality. You know what they had that everybody didn't? <laughs> A skill. Their parents taught them to think differently. So what they did is this. <laughs> I love this. They sat the kid down and said the whole rigmarole, five minutes, if you don't eat it, you'll get other things. But here's what I want you to do. When you feel like you want to eat it, imagine that it's something different. Imagine that it's a roach. Imagine that it's, 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 it's the worst fruit you've ever had. What, what are they doing when they're saying that? They're giving them a skill. 50% of the kids passed. Why? Because all they did is they took the motivation part, but they gave them a skill. And 50% of the kids said, oh, I can do that. And that's what they did. And so what they have on film now is they have kids looking at it going, oh, and they stop and they go, ew. You see them act it out, like, oh, no. Like, no. And they smell like, oh. And they start doing it. And guess what? They all, like, 50% passed. Are you guys with me on this one? Some of us, we have motivation. We just don't have the ability, and nobody's helping us obtain the skill. Where do you get the skill? You're supposed to get it from church. You're supposed to get it from Bible studies, the gatherings that we do, all these different things. How do you do it? The Bible. Start reading it. Jesus gives lots of skills, not just motivation. That's why we tell you, read the Bible, because you get the skills there. Here was my last thought. I think it's my last thought. Yes? Okay, sure. If you give motivation without the ability to accomplish, then all you've created is, is depression masked as good intentions. Let it sink in, because I feel like this is where most of us are at. You sit back and you say, I'm a good person, I try to help people out, but most of the time all we're doing is giving motivation and not helping with the ability. So what we've done is we told people, you're good, you got this. And then when they go away, they have no skills to accomplish it, so they feel bad about themselves and feel like they are broken. Like they can't do it. Something's wrong with them. They get depressed and you walk around going, oh, I had all the good intentions. Yes? I know that might have probably hit hard, I apologize. <laughs> But I want you to understand, we've got to get to a place as the church, as Christ followers, we have to be done with this idea of judging other people off of a look, off of a statement, off of, of, of a living situation, off of social, off of structural, off of personal. We've got to start looking at people like God does and say, if we're going to have influence on the world in any way, shape, or form, then what we need to do is we need to start acting like the donkey and asking God for the ability to talk. Did that make sense? So here's what I'd like you guys to do today. We're gonna to get into worship. I know I, just, I overspoke because obviously I, anyways. <laughs> Band, you can come on stage. As we get into worship, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to think about some people that maybe, that maybe, I know, right? You walked in front of the camera, bro. I want you to think about some people that were maybe donkeys in your life. People that maybe you beat over time. Because you didn't realize what they were really trying to do. And here's what I'd like you to do. Text them. Write them a letter. Email. 
today at some point. Don't let it go till tomorrow. I'm, giving, I'm trying to motivate you and give you a skill. Text them, write them a letter, email them. However, heck, if you have to drive to their house if you don't have any of their information. And just tell them, my bad, I'm sorry. I saw what you were trying to do and I messed up. And then be like, thanks for being a donkey in my life. And then explain it. <laughs> and then explain it. But here's the thing, don't forget about these people. And then, do your best to be a donkey in somebody else's life. Like Mr. Rogers. Be like that. Treat your neighbor as yourself. Don't just give motivation, give ability. Help people figure it out. Remember how we started this whole thing about church? That we're supposed to rely on one another to help each other? And let's do it. Help people change the frame if you need to. Help people with the ability. Be the hands and feet of the Lord. Amen? So Father, help us be that influence. Help us be the people that you've called us to be, Father. God, we love you so much. And I ask God in worship right now that you would just help us. Just remind us, Father God, of those people in our lives. And God, if there's anybody that we just need to go and apologize to, may, may we do it? Just like Balaam did. He knelt down before the Lord. And he said, I've sinned. I apologize. But God, help us remember how to influence people and stop judging. We ask this in your name, Father. The atmosphere is changed. Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. But the Spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing now. There's the Spirit of the Lord. Evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love. Your love surrenders us. You're the reason we came.
God, fall fresh on us. We need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Here as in heaven. Spirit of God, fall fresh.
Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Our hearts adore. Poured out on the feet of Jesus in our affection, our devotion. Poured out on the feet of Jesus in our affection, our devotion. Poured out on the feet of Jesus.
turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can You're the only one who can Cause there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Let's sing that all together one last time. Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. So, Father God, there is nothing better than you, and I think we can all give an amen to that. God, we're going to do our part. We want to be the influence to other people. God, you have put us in places and positions for a reason. You put the children in our life for a reason. You put us in our job for a reason. You put us in places for reasons. And that reason is to be an influence, Father God, to those around us. So God, we no longer judge. We get a backstory. We don't just motivate. We give the ability. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you for coming and showing us how to do this firsthand. We thank you, Father God, for who you are. And I pray, Lord, that we leave here and we go be a good neighbor to all around us. We go and be a donkey to those around us. And we thank the donkeys in our lives. And all that agreed said, Amen. Amen.